It's July 1st, 2021. This is Rook. He was the first ever politician of Iranian descent elected to any legislature in Canada or the United States. Dr. Reza Moridi was already a prominent scientist, physicist and professor by the time he was elected to the Ontario Parliament in 2007. But then he became a household name in the Iranian Canadian community as a representative of Richmond Hill and a cabinet minister during his 11 years in office. On this Canada Day, it's only fitting to have him here to reflect on his his journey, biculturalism, politics, and professional passions. Dr. Reza Moridi joining us in the Rook studio, plus a new edition of It's All Persian to Us. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 123 of Rook. Yes, thank you, Jian. Lotf Kardam. Hey, Lotf Kardam. Lotf Kardam. Lotf Kardam. Hope you're keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Salam, Dustan Aziz. I'm very happy to be Hello to you from Toronto, Canada, and it is Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. Uh, Happy Canada Day, oh, yeah. we're, Okay, we're going to clap. Well, there's lots of reasons to clap, but, you know, there are mixed feelings about this holiday this year, uh, based on some very sad stories of historic injustice that are in the news currently. Uh, but we have reason for exhilaration because this is a memorable Canada Day for Shia. We're going to get to the oh, yes, reason. Yes, that's right. Shia, have you had your maple syrup? today did you drink a beer are you listening to the tragically hip come on let's go <laughs> yes uh, no i haven't had my maple shrimp but i'm gonna drink beer and then i will have my go. what was the last the one? tragically hip <laughs> keon please send him some tragically <laughs> hip I music what's I, uh, that yeah. <laughs> what what is that yeah Wow. <laughs> the You're musical education it, it has to continue. The Tragically Hip are arguably, well, I mean, you know, the greatest rock band to come from Canada and embedded in Canadian lore and Canadian culture. Oh, yeah. No, I, I knew Rush, but I didn't. Well, Rush is, that's why I said arguably, because I didn't yeah. want it. There's Rush, yeah. there's Blue Rodeo, there's the Guess Who, but uh, the band, but, but yeah, Tragically Hip are. Oh. Uh, Shia will have some. Um, more Canadian indoctrination uh, <laughs> sure. sessions uh, over this uh, tonight, Canada yeah. Day night. I'm going to play you some Tragically Hip. Uh, Keon, a special Canada Day to you because you are mostly American or half American. I'm or half, yeah. I don't, it's kind of a... It's kind of like for our American friends who are listening and wondering what... It's, it's sort of like Independence Day mm-hmm. without, without the guns. Basically, <laughs> without sure. uh, without sure, shooting yeah, no. things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want to go down that road, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's uh, what do we even say? Ruse Canada uh, or uh, oh, Ru- Ruse Canada for those of us who are doing intermittent fasting. <laughs> 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 Doctor Reza Moridi coming up as our feature guest today. Uh, you know, if you do live in Canada, uh, and a bunch of our audience is here. And if you're of Iranian background, you surely know of Dr. Moridi, our first, perhaps our most prominent politician of Iranian descent, as well as a well-regarded uh, scientist uh, and uh, a man whose uh, appearance has not changed for at least four decades. You're right. He looks exactly <laughs> the same. Point. He, he does. never changes. That's it's right. uh, you know, I don't know what it is. Get his it's, secret. <laughs> I, I mean, he could be, uh, you know, he could be forty. He could be eighty. I don't know. Yeah, he Who knows? <laughs> Actually, I do know. But his he, form has stayed the same too. You know, he looks his like form. he's having a healthy life. Maybe he's doing the uh, the intermittent yeah, rosé. You should yeah, ask yeah. him. <laughs> He looks good. That's my first question <laughs> to the esteemed uh, scientist uh, slash politician on this candidate. Do you uh, do you do fasting to keep <laughs> your weight down? <laughs> We're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. We're on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. 
Uh, we're on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, CastBox, Telegram. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook and see us on social media, switch over to YouTube or Instagram right now. And as ever, if you like your descriptions and bulletins in English and Farsi, check us out on uh, Telegram. I have to say, you know, I am a Canadian and this country has meant a lot to me. And that is the case for a lot of us who are immigrants. Immigration is hard. It's difficult to uh, coordinate and make a reality uh, for a lot of Iranians who arrive mm -hmm. here and who want to come here. On that note and on this day, a shout out to Kati Kavandi and Kati Kavandi Immigration Services Incorporated. Kati is a certified immigration consultant and the CEO of her company. And she's a very well-reviewed resource for those wanting to come to Canada or who are here here and need help. She has offices in Toronto and Tehran. So Kathy is an immigrant to Canada from Iran herself and learned the ropes of the process for coming to Canada, has a tremendous knowledge in immigration procedures and legislation. Her company acts as the client's advocate before the courts, government officials, IRB, IRCC offices. She makes herself and her team available throughout the process. And of course, she does this in Persian and English. You can find her at katikavandi.ca. CA, Katy Kavandi.ca. We're linking to that on our screen and on the description of today's episode if you're listening on any of our platforms. I should also note that Katy makes it really makes it a priority to give back to the community, and we appreciate her support for doing that and helping make this episode of Rook possible. Thank you, Katy Kavandi. And you know, uh, related to this, uh, the, why I'm enjoying talking about immigration is because we actually have today a member of our Rook team, in fact, a member of our on-air team sitting across the glass there, <laughs> our dear Groovy Shia, yes. without the help of Kathy Comandy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you did it without her. Uh, tell us what happened last Friday. Uh, I applied for my immigration here and it was accepted. So yes. Yay, yes. Accepted, congratulations. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Now you probably need to learn who the Tragically Hip are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because uh, if you're going to stay in this country. <laughs> actually, I just know the uh, what was the name? Junkie Cowboys? Something like that. Well, the, they, they're the Cowboy Junkies. <laughs> cowboy although junkies. <laughs> there's also ca Junkie Cowboys uh, <laughs> in Alberta and other places. Uh. Maybe start with Nickelback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's start with Celine Dion. That's it. Baby steps. And we'll get to, uh, and then maybe Shania Twain, Brian Adams, I'm really Drake, and we'll get to the Tragically Hip. How about the Junkie Cowboys? <laughs> I, I really like uh, the Junkie Cowboys. <laughs> oh. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I'm in good spirits. I mean, it is Canada Day, but I'm actually happy for my country of England. That's we have nice. advanced to the quarterfinals right. of the Euros. We, like I have really to do <laughs> with this part team. Of the team. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough game, but we did it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, as a kid who grew up in England and is uh, used to the English team. Uh, <laughs> Uh, choking at some point in every uh, <laughs> tournament, I still expect failure, but I am d desperately keeping my fingers crossed that um, because now it's, you know, the next game, I think it's Ukraine and then uh, mm -hmm. uh, Denmark or Croatia. Like, we could actually do this, you know? Yeah. You there's know, actually a chance. There's a chance. So yes. you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> so um, uh, come on, then, England. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I think it's going to end up being England and Spain. Shia is the only Ir person of Iranian descent, besides me, because I grew up in England, yeah. that does not support Germany. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, I started posting the, uh, the, the English flag. I was almost yeah. lynched by my community. <laughs> not because I said anything bad about Iran, but about Germany. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Don't you dare not support oh, the German awesome. team if you're Iranian. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was uh, always alone in my class uh, I'm the only person who support England. Yes. Like Euro and. Yes. Like well, now you've found well, your brother. Yeah. Yeah. I think you could have just ended that sentence as at, <laughs> I was always alone in my class. <laughs> <laughs> and that probably would have. <laughs> Uh, listening to Junkie Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> junkie Cowboys. <laughs> I know. If I didn't know Shia so well, I would think that he's doing that as a you know, joke. And I would think that's <laughs> performative. Let me see. How can, what can I say that's funny? But the, he actually talks like that. <laughs> so just to fill everybody in, there was a band called the Cowboy Junkies, an indie rock band from the 80s and 90s. And... Uh, 
just the sometimes image. affectionately known as the junkie cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> just the image of cowboys, you know, in, <laughs> with Maybe needles in their arms. He was listening to junkie cowboy, yeah. but yeah. it's not a band. Yeah. Maybe he likes the sound. Maybe it was in Iran. You really <laughs> never know. Uh. Hey, listen, we've been getting a lot of feedback. I wanted to mention this uh, for uh, our episode on Monday with an interview with Dr. Shaheen Nouri, the neurologist, the Iranian-American neurologist, the great doctor, who has been given only three months left to live if he can't find a stem cell donor. Now, uh, I'm really heartened by the number of people who have been sharing that episode and more importantly sharing information about how you can um, help Dr. Nouri or help people who um, people of Iranian descent and others who need uh, to find stem cell donors uh, so please check out that episode and check out hashtag hope for Shaheen the number four hope for Shaheen we also have the links to all the various sites where you can um, become a donor or give blood etc on that episode but uh, lots of letters coming yeah in for, for too, sure right? so a lot of beautiful letters of people really just it really raised awareness people are going in and I hope so you know, I hope yeah. so we'll get to some of those letters on Monday in the coming days on on Rook uh, the great young uh, Iranian artist based in Canada Monali Jamal uh, who will be in the Rook studio, uh, Bessar Boulour and Firuz Zahedi. This is the legendary Iranian-American photographer and BFF of Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited for this one. It's going to be really, really just... He's a he's an amazing guy. He still is the go-to person, whether mm-hmm. you're Leo DiCaprio or Angelina yeah. Jolie. He's the Hollywood go-to person for your official, I mean, he did all the Vanity Fair right. covers. and He also you know. worked under Andy Warhol, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, he was hand-selected by, uh, hand-selected, I mean, uh, he was selected by Andy, Andy Warhol. You know, Firuz Zahidi, I think he was probably in his mid-20s. And he was in DC. This mm-hmm. young Iranian guy, yeah, he gets he gets picked by Andy Warhol, uh, the iconoclastic uh, artist, the the famous. I mean, it's his story is almost mythical. Yeah. Fidu Zahidi. Yeah, yeah. I'm very much looking forward to talking to him. And um, he's no junkie cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> he may be a cowboy. Well, certainly is not. <laughs> and I don't know what his practices are, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have been listening for the Junkie Drake. <laughs> junkie Drake. <laughs> junkie rapper. Uh, we have an episode, but like Dr. Reza Mordi's regretting, like he's just like, why did I agree to come on this show? What are they talking about? <laughs> Uh, what is, uh, we have an It's All Persian to Us coming up today, too. Is this a Canada Day it themed? It is a uh, Canada Day edition. It's something related to Canada and Persia. Somehow there's a link oh, between wow. the two, yes. Is there a cat involved? By uh, no, no cats today. Not today. Sorry to disappoint Either. you. All right. A new edition of It's All Persian to Us coming up. Uh, we'll get to that, but let's get to our feature guests. Thank you, Keon, Shia, and Reza. On this Canada Day edition of Rook. Let's bring him on. Keon, Keon you got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody get Keon out of the yes, uh, studio. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mr. Moore, you got to go. <laughs> Uh, I'm honored to say that our feature guest today is the first ever politician from the Iranian community elected to any legislature in Canada or the United States. Dr. Reza Moridi was a cabinet minister here in Ontario as an MPP who served as Minister of Research, Innovation and Science and Minister of Training Colleges and Universities during his 11 years in office. He was first elected to the Ontario Parliament in 2007, re-elected in 2011, 2014 and 2016. Prior to politics, Dr. Moridi had a 17-year career at the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada, where he was the vice president and chief scientist. He also worked in the electrical industry as an executive and in academia as a professor and administrator. Dr. Moridi was born in Urmia in northwest Iran. He grew up in Urmia and Tehran, studied in the UK, moved to Canada in the late 80s for his contributions to the understanding of nuclear materials, radiation and health physics. Dr. Moridi has received the Education and Communication Award from the Canadian Nuclear Society and the US Health Physics Society designated him as a fellow. He was also elected as a fellow of the UK Institute of Physics and the UK Institute 
Institution of Engineering and Technology. He is a senior fellow at Massey College, University of Toronto, and honorary adjunct professor at Shandong Normal University, China. Those in Toronto and Canada, of course, certainly know Dr. Moridi's contributions over the years. And right now, Reza Moridi joins me in the Rook studio. Hello, sir. Hello, I'm Xi'an. It's a great pleasure to be on your show. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for being here and happy Canada Day to you. Well, happy Canada Day to you too and also to your audience. Thank you. Well, of course, as you know, there are mixed feelings about celebrating this day uh, this year. But in terms of the tradition, you know, there are people listening around the world, as, as you know. So we've been training them, explaining to them what Canada Day <laughs> is. And, uh, you know, it's Independence Day in the States or Bastille Day, but we were trying to figure out what the Iranian equivalent would be. What's the equivalent in Iran, do you think, to Canada Day? Well, Iran has, was never a colony, uh, so we were an independent nation for 25 centuries. Uh, so I guess um, uh, the Cyrus the Great's birthday might be equivalent to our Canada Day. Yes, closest to that, yes. Now, one of the things I thought we would focus on is, uh, as, a, as a subtext to to this uh, throughout this interview is biculturalism is is being of two places because you would be um, a primary example of this uh, and an exemplary example of this for our community uh, let me ask you what does I mean in general uh, what does Canada Day mean to you well you know we are new Canadians I mean uh, I, I, I came to Canada about 30 years ago with my family and Canada means a lot because you, you, you feel a sense of belonging to this land on this very day. And also it gives you an opportunity to learn a little bit about the history of Canada. Though Canada is a new country, relatively uh, much newer than the, our homeland, Iran, but still there are lots of history behind this country. And how Canada evolved from being you know, a colony to a confederation of four uh, provinces uh, to start with, and now we have uh, 10 provinces, three territories. There's lots of history, lots of wonderful history. Of course, our history has also its own problem, but in the meantime, there are lots of good things about Canadian history which could be uh, very helpful and useful for particularly new Canadians to, uh, to learn about the history of their adopted land. There's certainly um, dark moments uh, to the history that are that are are in the headlines these days as well. But uh, interesting that you call yourself a new Canadian still. So what's the what's the statute of limitations on being a new Canadian? If you came in the eighties, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are, are you not just a Canadian at this point? <laughs> well, I am. I am a Canadian, but yeah. always being new is is a good thing, right? <laughs> well, that's true. That's uh, you're fresh. Uh, yeah, we're yeah. fresh. But yeah, I I, I think I'm, I I feel new in the sense that uh, I always you know every day I appreciate the opportunity uh, myself and my family had to to be accepted uh, to this land and, and to feel that I am a Canadian. So I remind myself that, you know, I, I have to really appreciate uh, the fact that Canada accepted me, my family, and also my uh, my fellow Iranians who fled, you know, our, our homeland in the past 40 years, and yeah. they still there are flooding and they're coming to this wonderful land. Did you, uh, I'm going to get into your story of being in Iran and, and how it is that you ended up here, but uh, all, while we're on the topic of Canada Day in this country, did you have an idea of Canada before you, I'm assuming you'd never been here before you emigrated in the late 80s, right? This is, you, you hadn't actually been to Canada before that. No. What, what was your, I know my dad, uh, you know, when we came to Canada, uh, and of course I grew up in England, and then we came here, and he was, uh, you're going to like this because it's a, a large a liberal reference, but, you know, he was a big fan of the earlier Prime Minister Trudeau, the uh, Justin's dad. Yes. <laughs> and um, and <clears throat> had this very positive idea of this welcoming place and, uh, and pivoted when given the option of going back to Iran with his family or coming to Canada, uh, really wanted us to come here. What was your impression before you came here? of where you thought you were going? Well, um, more or less like your dad, uh, Gian, but first of all, I didn't come to Canada. I, haven't, I hadn't been in Canada before coming as an immigrant to this country. 
Uh, I've been in the U.S. before, but not Canada. So my knowledge about Canada was very limited, actually. Uh, the only thing I knew that this is a very cold country, uh, which didn't surprise cool me. Cool or uh, cold? Uh, well, <laughs> cold or colder country. <laughs> it's but, cold, uh, right? It can cold, be cold, cool in some uh, people's uh, eyes, yeah, but cold, it's also cold. No, yeah, cold. Yeah, yeah cold yeah. country. That's what I meant. But I didn't bother about that because my hometown, the town where I've been born in Iran, Urmia, was also very cold, more or less the same uh -huh. climate. So I didn't mind that. But I didn't know much about Canada before coming to this, to this wonderful land. And what happened when you got here? I found people so welcoming and uh, and of course the country was so well advanced and the city of Toronto is you know a world class city and uh, how do you uh, define biculturalism for yourself I mean you're an interesting guy because you're proudly from Ermia you're obviously a proud Iranian uh, but you're a proud Canadian I mean you've served in office here for over a decade um, is it half and half if somebody says where are you from or how do you identify how do you answer the question well I identify myself as Canadian uh, originally from Iran uh, so that's how I, I identify myself. I'm, I'm proud Canadian, um, Gian. And uh, uh, with regard to that question of uh, multiculturalism, I think this is uh, this is wonderful uh, philosophy. So that every nation, every people, they can keep their own identity. And do you, once you accept people's identity, their culture, uh, then that is of the, the whole thing. When I was at the at the parliament as an MPP, uh, I brought a legislation whereby Ontario uh, proclaimed February 21st as International Mother Language Day in Ontario, uh, and that's a recognition of people's culture, people's language. And as you know, there are more than 150 languages spoken in the city of Toronto. There are I don't know how many nationalities or ethnicities we have uh, in, in the city and everybody living in peace, everybody's accepting everybody's Not always, language. Not always, but, well, yeah, but yeah, mostly, yeah. yes, yeah, so culture, language. Mm -hmm. So, so that, is, that is, I think, one of, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things which I love about Canada, this multicultural um, philosophy which we have in place in this country. As a public person who has been so high profile in the Iranian community, uh, has it been hard sometimes to navigate representing Iranians? I mean, because the community has always seen you as, you know, he, he, that's our guy. He's the Iranian guy. Whether they agree with you or not or like you or not, he's, a, he's our guy there, you know. Uh, but, you know, you're serving in a legislature in Ontario, in Canada. You're serving Canadians who rightfully would also see you as their guy. Um has it ever been difficult stick handling between uh, the communities? Well, not really. I mean, uh, when I before entering into politics, you know, becoming an MPP, uh, I knew that I'm going to run in the riding of Richmond Hill, representing people of Richmond Hill. But in the meantime, as you rightly mentioned, you know, uh, Iranians living across the across Canada, I should say. Uh, they had expectations, and I prepared myself to uh, <laughs> to somehow to deal with those expectations. So somebody calls from Saskatchewan and says, "My tap isn't working. I need you." Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yes, actually, one. And you're like, I don't represent Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, one night uh, I, I picked up the phone. It was around the 11 o'clock or 10:30, uh, uh, calling, and then my wife said, "Well, it's 10:30, and people are sleeping at uh -huh. this time." I said, "Don't worry. The person I'm calling in, it's 8 o'clock or 8:30. There, I'm calling." Saskatchewan. There was someone who called me, an Iranian guy in, Sis in Saskatoon, had some issues and problems. So I had to return. <laughs> I was joking about Saskatchewan. So somebody so actually called actually you. Actually called me from Saskatchewan. I had calls from Alberta as well, and uh, you know, they, uh, they assumed that you represented them somehow. Uh, well, they they did. Yes, they they they, they were, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So how did you <laughs> did you explain that you have no jurisdiction over uh, uh, Saskatchewan or, or no no. Or, I, I, I was just listening to them and trying to solve their problems if I, if I could. And uh, yeah, that's interesting. A, it says interesting. Well, that's my point, though. Iranians would want to own you, you know, to us. I mean, I say that in a loving way, but, you know, would be like, uh, that's somebody that we can talk to. We have our representative. We're proud. He's there. Um, but, you know, you have to, and I've talked to some other other politicians, friends of yours, Ali Asasi, others about yeah. this, this issue where, um, you know, you have to sometimes explain to members of our Iranian community that you you don't just represent Iranians in Canada. <laughs> you you know you represent uh, everybody, right? Yeah, so, in my writing, yes, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, well for, for, for many people, they, they, did, they couldn't recognize this. You know, they could say, well, well Reza Maridi is Iranian, so he's our representative. Yes. Even during my first election, I mean, at that time, um, in 2006, 2007, that time, Iranians weren't much involved in Canadian politics, and many of them, they didn't understand uh, the meaning of writing. Because in Iran, though we had elections for 100 years, uh, but uh, uh, we didn't have writings. There's no so writings. You, no, you, you become a uh, MP or MPP from a city, and uh -huh. then maybe a city is represented by five people or ten people or two people, uh -huh. etc. So really, they didn't have that uh, sort of understanding. So anyway, people were. Calling I don't even me. know how you describe mm, it. Yeah, if, if, yeah. In for people who are listening in Iran, I guess we, we have these arbitrarily drawn lines around yeah, yeah. squares of pieces of land in, yeah, yeah, in Canada, yeah, and yeah, those yeah. are the ridings. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So. Even people in other ridings in other cities in Ontario. Uh, they used to go to the polling stations and they're searching my name to vote <laughs> <laughs> in 2007. Wow. Yeah, we're making yeah. your audience look bad. So, but, no, but, no, but, no. But this it is was their kindness. You yes, know, they, yes, their yes. kindness, and that it was I, a I new. Really appreciate it. I'll bet a lot of I'll bet a lot of new immigrant Iranians probably didn't vote. I had never voted before until you had it just weren't you know i mean it's not unique to iranians a lot of folks who come here in, in the oh, beginning yeah. you know there's the i mean everything is new the pedagogical approach is new the the form of you know figuring out how to get yourself on the bat uh, to, to to be able to vote is is new uh so it was probably an education for some people. I, I, w I would say so. I, I mean, I've seen many, many examples, uh, Jean, but before 2007, as you said, Iranians, they were not much involved in Canadian politics because politics for Iranians was a kind of dirty job because they all, you know, during the previous regime, mm -hmm. the current regime, uh, we didn't have democracy in Iran. So people didn't take politics really serious. Uh, I tell you one example. Um, in 2007 election again, uh, an elderly couple came to my office and uh, and they said, well, we just voted for you. And the gentleman told me, he said, you know, I'm 80 or 85 years old. He said, I never voted during the, the previous regime in Iran. I never voted during the current regime in Iran. <laughs> and in the past 15 years I've been living in Canada, I never voted. Wow. For the first time in my life, he said, I went to a polling station and I voted and I voted for you. That must have felt like an honor. Yeah, it was. You know, it's interesting to talk about you as a public person um, because for as long as I've known you, which I think is at least 15 years, you know, That's right. I've always thought you were too uh, soft spoken. Uh, too gentle to <laughs> <laughs> in your you. manners to be a politician. I mean, you speak like a like like a chief scientist uh, <laughs> at a radiation safety institute, you know? <laughs> which uh, uh, would a younger Reza Mordi have been surprised that you've ended up with a career in politics? Um, not not really, Gian. I always had the passion for politics since uh, you know I was a young boy. Uh, so uh, it was a kind of in me uh, politics uh, to a certain degree. Uh, but of course, when I came to Canada, I found, you know, this country is a democratic country and uh, uh, everything basically is ready to, uh, uh, to put that passion into practice. Well, I, tw 20 years later, I mean, it took, it took you 20 years. Uh, and in between then, you were a, a scientist, uh, you were, you know, working away. So you always had this sense that you, this, that you would end up being a public person. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't expect it that. But uh, as I said, you know, I had a passion for politics since I was a young boy, always. I was interested in politics and I was interested in political affairs internationally and in Iran when I was in the UK. Uh, so, uh, you know, that passion was in me. Uh, for Do you feel like you would have been involved in politics in Iran if the revolution hadn't happened? Um, well, I, I, maybe, mm. maybe. Uh, at that time, before revolution, my, my main focus was just, you know, in academia to, uh, uh, to become a full professor at the university and so on and so forth. But, yeah, I was also in, uh, interested in how things are happening in the country. It's also interesting that you're a scientist because most politicians tend to be lawyers or uh, business people. There's not a lot of scientists who become politicians. Do you enjoy that? You're, you're, <laughs> that, that, that you're not just another lawyer? <laughs> well, I do. I mean, uh, politics is something, like any other profession, I, if I use the word profession for it, though it's not really a profession in that sense, you have to have a passion, you have to, have, you have to like it. 
as otherwise you can't do it. But being a scientist, yes, it's uh, generally the scientists, they don't enter into politics, not very many of them. Uh -huh. uh, though in the past, Jean, we had uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher was a scientist. She was a chemist. Oh, uh, Angela, that's right. Angela yeah. Merkel, the uh, oh, you know, ch chancellor right, of Germany, right. she's a physicist, actually. Right. Uh, so we had uh, quite a few uh, politicians uh, coming from uh, science background. Jimmy Carter was a physicist uh, with a degree in physics, first degree in physics. But he was if a peanut he, farmer. Uh, well, later became oh, a okay. peanut <laughs> farmer. But I think he, <laughs> has, he had the, the first degree in, in, in physics. Okay. So yeah, there were a few people, not very many. I sometimes use the, uh, the, the example, I say, well, there was only one physicist who was very uh, a wise person who didn't accept to become a politician, <laughs> and that was Albert Einstein, who exactly. was uh, uh, offered to be the president of Israel. He didn't accept. Well, I mean, it's true, you know. I think of the re I think of scientists on this, a chief scientist at an important institute like you were, you know, on this pedestal. Baba de Gennaro to you, what are you doing going into <laughs> politics? <laughs> but, you know, being a physicist, being a, f uh, and a former academic and a scientist helped me in my, in my job as a minister. How so? Uh, well, I was minister for science and, you know, as you mentioned, innovation and also minister for higher education. Uh, in the province of Ontario. So I was dealing with universities, with uh, research institutions, mm. with academia. Uh, so coming from that background, I could communicate with my colleagues at the uh, academic world, at the research world, at the science world much easily, and they could also communicate with me much easily. So, so I think that that was quite helpful to me, that kind of background. Again, it's, it's interesting to hear that you always were interested in going into politics because, you know, you're very polite and self, you, you don't walk into a room kind of um, looking like you want to dominate the place. You're very gentle and very, I mean, in the time I've, whenever I've seen you anyway, you're soft spoken. And so it's almost like this guy who was this important scientist who decided, okay, I'll go into public service, but I'm, I'm not going to be a you know I'm not going to be a zany politician type and I wonder what you were like as a kid I mean were you a kind of a version of a public person as a kid or were you a, uh, were you very popular did you hang you know were you always leading the groups of kids as well or were you a, a more of a, a kid uh, who enjoyed his solitude well as a kid I mean I, I, I went to school in Urmia up to grade 11 uh, in the school, I played basketball. I was the captain of our team uh, oh. at school, and then um, going to. Uh, so you were a popular kid. Uh, more or less. Well, yeah, I was the captain I, I, of the I, basketball I, I, team. That, that's usually. well in that sense, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was in Tehran University, um, I joined a society um, called uh, Urmia or Rizai. At that time, the city was called Rizai Student Association, mm. uh, which is equivalent to our student unions in in, in Canadian universities. Uh, so I was very much involved at the, at the student politics, and uh, for a couple of years I was the president of the association. So, so that also gave me a kind. Of, it was a kind of political work, really, in that sense. So, yeah, that was uh, a kind of me at that time. How would you describe life as a kid growing up in Urmia? Uh, well, um, you know, uh, I think life was good. It's the nineteen uh, fifties. I mean, uh, what what was. Urmia in the 1950s even like? Uh, well, uh, Urmia in the 1950s was just after the Second World War and uh, uh, of course the province of Azerbaijan was under occupation of uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. um, it, it wasn't a pleasant story always, mm -hmm. occupation story, wars and, uh, and internal frictions, etc. But fortunately, uh, after the Second World, there was peace and the quiet, and uh, you know society was uh, moving forward. And Urmia was such a beautiful city, a multi sort of ethnic city, and uh, it used to be called Paris of Iran. Hmm. Uh, so it was a wonderful city, and the, the, the you know the nature is so beautiful, and uh, it was very pleasant. And what were you like? Uh, I, I, lo I loved I loved the city. I, I, I had so many friends. Still, I keep uh, you know my affiliation with the city and with many friends from various communities over there. Really, you you're friends with p people you were friends with as a kid. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were some of them. We were connected through social media these days. So it's wow, a, it's, it's it's easy. Yes, you go to the UK to get your PhD at Brunel University, I guess in the late 60s, early 70s? Uh, yeah, early uh, 70s, yes. W what was that experience like for you? Well, it was very interesting. Uh, you know, I remember, uh, Jean, when I first uh, sat in, in the class, we were, I think, 14, 13, 14 students 
uh, at master's degree program at uh, Brunel University. My English was very, very poor. I, 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 I spoke very hardly English. And the only thing I could do is I could just, you know, uh, take some notes. Uh, uh, but towards the end of that program, uh, I must tell you that I became number one top student at master's program. So I worked very hard, very hard. But it was very interesting. It was a very good experience. So after about one year, I got my master's uh, degree called Master of Technology degree in semiconductor physics and technology, and then continued my PhD. Did you like being in the UK? Yes, I did. Yes, I love London. Uh, well, London, uh, you know, for before coming to Canada, we always considered England as our second home. And my daughter was born in, in, in London. Like yourself, you were born in London That's too. That's right, yes. So she was born in London as well uh, and uh, at uh, Queen Charlotte Hospital. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, London is, is a beautiful so city. you make an interesting decision in the mid-70s, which is you, you decide to go back to Iran. Yes. You could have stayed in London. Many people did. Uh, of course, this is pre-revolution. You go back to Iran and you end up becoming a professor there. Tell me about the decision to go back to Iran and what life was like for you before the revolution happened in Iran. Well, you know, we Iranians, we always consider ourselves Iranians and we never, uh, Iranians weren't immigrant nation. Hmm. Uh, even students uh, studying in, in Europe or in the U.S., almost 99.9 percent of these students, uh, they used to go back to Iran after completing uh, their education. Hmm. I had the opportunity, as you said, to stay in England, uh, but I didn't. Even I had the opportunity to get British passport for my daughter, who was born in England. I never applied for a British passport hmm. for my daughter because I said, you know, we are Iranians, we have to go back to our country to serve. And that's what I did. And the many, many Iranian students, after finishing their education, they used to go back to Iran to serve their country. And that's what I did. So after arriving in Iran, uh, I got a job um, at uh, Farah Pahlavi University as assistant professor and started my work there until revolution happened and uh, then everything became yeah. upside down. What was the revolution experience like for you? Well, it was very hard. It was extremely hard, particularly universities. Uh, the revolutionary government uh, f mostly focused on universities. Uh, you may have heard Khomeini was saying that all of our problem is from the universities. Right. Should, yeah. So he put very, very much focus on the, on the university, particularly the university where I was teaching. Farah Pahlavi University was the only a women's university in Iran and named after the queen, the former queen of Iran, Shabani Farah. Meaning it was co-ed? <coughs> no, it was just purely for women. It was for women, but you were teaching there? Yes, I was teaching there, yeah. So you were teaching just women? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, most of the uh, professors, they were men at that university. Huh. So, um, so what this happened to that university when? The well, th that's what I was trying to say, yeah. that that university was attacked more than uh, other universities, just I guess one of the reasons was because it was fully women's university. It was a new university established by uh, by the Queen to give more opportunities for women to enter into post-secondary education. Sure. So yeah, it was a difficult time. So what happens to you and your job after the revolution? Well, after revolution, when um, uh, then they elected me as uh, as dean of school of sciences, uh, but after a few months, then university was shut down and they closed all universities in Iran for three years. Can you imagine in a country I we didn't I, have? I mean, I, I can because I remember it. I was <coughs> yeah, a kid, but happened, I remember yeah, that happening. It, it happened for three years. There was no universities, and a few months after after closing or shutting down all universities, they purged um, university professors. Many, many university professors were first, hundreds or thousands of them, and I was one of them. So what did you do? <coughs> well, um, it was very difficult for, um, for a long time. First of all, you didn't have any salaries, any income. There was no job, nothing. Um, and also, in the beginning, people are looking at you with suspicions because they made lots of uh, rumors that, uh, you know, university professors, they are 
members of the Shah secret police and you know people will look at you from that perspective but after one month when people uh, noticed that uh, most you of no university <laughs> most yeah. of university professors they were purged right. even if you were not purged then people will look at you with some suspicion mm. how it comes you were not purged so yeah it was very tough very 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 tough um <clears throat> And into the 1980s, tell me about how you end up coming to Canada. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, after some years, I mean, I didn't want to leave Iran. I, mean, I always thought that, you know, things may change, et cetera, et cetera, but it didn't. So in 87, I got a job at the University of the South Pacific in the Fiji Islands. Oh, wow. Uh, so with the whole You didn't want to stay there? <laughs> it's a beautiful country. Yeah, uh, sounds pretty nice, yeah. It is a beautiful place, Gian. It's a lovely place and they're very kind people. So with the whole family, uh, we moved to Fiji Islands and uh, I, I was uh, teaching at the university there for two and a half years. And uh, uh, after two and a half years, uh, we had the opportunity to move to Canada. Uh, and in February 1990, uh, we moved from the uh, the peak of summer in Fiji Islands, which is in the in the, in the southern hemisphere, as you know, uh, to uh, to the uh, peak of the cold, yes. uh, Canadian cold in February uh, in in Toronto. So in 1990, we came to Can Canada in February 1990. That was uh, February 9th. So we celebrate Canada Day twice a year. One uh -huh. is uh, J July 1st, which is national. Day uh, and the other one is the Muridi family Canada Day, which is February 9th. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, you come to Canada uh, uh, and as a chartered engineer, chartered physicist, chief scientist. Tell me about this uh, working at the Radiation Safety Institute for almost 20 years, where you were vice president and you were a chief scientist. What did you What did you most learn working there? I learned quite a lot about Canada. First of all. Uh, I, it gave me an opportunity to travel quite quite a lot in uh, you know in many provinces uh, across our country, Canada, and also I got involved in the nuclear industry as a whole. So it gave me a lot of um, a lot of experience and expertise I gained through those years working at the institute. You know that my dad worked in uh, mm. the nuclear, he, he worked on the Darlington uh, nuclear power plant, working on the vacuum building. Oh, I see, civil I engineer. didn't know that. Yeah, and yeah. he, uh, and it was the liberal government, the Ontario liberal government, that contributed to him losing his job <laughs> because <laughs> they, you know, the Peterson government stopped the work on the, I mean, nuclear power has always been a bit of a political hot potato, as you know. It still uh, it is, yes. <laughs> it still is, that's right. I mean, even as you were saying that, I was thinking, uh-oh, some people are going to go, he worked in nuclear, what? You know? uh, I always used to say, but my dad is exempt from that because he was working on the safety building. He yes. was working on the, yeah. uh, you know, the vacuum building. It's the, it's the safety valve, right? That's right, yeah. Um, um, tell me about this decision then. So I, this is really where I wanted to work up to, 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 to enter politics in 2007. I mean, we've, we've talked a little bit about you, you saying that you were always interested in it and you uh, felt the calling, but uh, that, that decision, given that there hadn't been a blueprint before you, that there hadn't been a number of Iranians in Canada or in North America who had been uh, members of parliament of, of a legislature, uh, tell me about that decision. What, do you remember exactly when you decided, I'm going to go for it, I'm going to do this? Well, before that, um, you know, in 2003 uh, election, Liberal Party, a couple of my friends there, uh, they asked me to run for the office because I was involved in the Liberal Party and they knew of me and all of that. So I thought, no, it's too early. I, you know, um, but I'll just, you know, <clears throat> I'll, I'll try to help politicians rather than being at the front line. And then uh, within those four years, from 2003 up to 2007, leading to 2007 election, uh, back to the point you mentioned earlier um, in our um, conversation, um, Gian, I thought, you know, for the Iranian community, we were a new community at that time, but we were just establishing ourselves. And I said, look, this is a democratic country, and we as a, as a community, as a member of larger Canadian family, we have to contribute to the management of our bigger home, which is our country, Canada, our province of Ontario. And we Iranians, we have to do, uh, to, you know, to, 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 to contribute our share. So when the party asked me again to consider running in 2006, uh, running, getting closer to 2007 election, 
I gave some thoughts to it, particularly on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon. I was sitting in my study room and thinking, you know, whether should I go for it, shouldn't I go for it? And then I went to my wife. She was in the kitchen um, sitting there and reading a book, I believe. And I, I went to her and I said, Perry, you know, uh, I'm considering <laughs> to, to, uh, uh, to run. And she said, uh, well, have you given... Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, she was very supportive. She okay. said, well, if you think you can and you can make a difference, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, go for it. I said, well, I'll go for it only with one condition, if you accept it, if you <laughs> right. support me. And she agreed. So then I gave a call to my friend, uh, Greg Sorbara, uh, who was uh, president of the party at that time and a dear friend. So I called him. I said, Greg, uh, I made my decision. I'm going to for it. And he said, oh, that's wonderful. And you made my day. I remember that's the word he, he used. <laughs> so he said, come and see me next, uh, next day. So anyway, that's how it started. And... Uh, and of course, um, I was successful in the election. Of course, you were yes, in, yeah. in Richmond Hill. Now, did you uh, did anybody try to talk you out of it? Did you have any people, uh, extended family or friends, or <coughs> say you know you don't want to get involved in this stuff? Well, uh, almost everyone was supportive, but one particular friend, one particular dear friend, in fact, <laughs> he called me one day. I was at my office at Radiation Safety Institute. Uh, my phone rang and this gentleman, my friend, he was on the phone and uh, for about an hour he was trying to convince me not to run, saying that, oh, look, you are not going to elect it, they are not going to elect an Iranian, they are not going to vote for an Iranian guy, mm. uh, this is Canada, you know, we are, it's too early for Iranians to become a member of parliament. Mm. Um, so, um, so I told him, I said, look, um, I'm going to run if I don't get elected, that's okay. Uh, it's okay not to be elected, you know, not everyone wins election. This is a democratic country, so we have to try. If I get elected, that's, that would be great, but if I lose, it's, it's fine. No problem, don't worry. So yeah, that was one example. I remember <clears throat> the ripples going through the community when you got elected. It was a big deal. It was, a, um, you know, I, I, I grew up here and, and I remember very distinctly, in fact, I wrote about this in my book about uh, the, by the mid 1980s being a kid and I remember always being interested in, in you know politics and I remember thinking well I could never run in this country because I my name is too weird you know if I had known uh, that it was possible you know 20 30 years later that uh, a guy named Reza Moridi was gonna um, be run and, and win it, it would have been in incredibly inspiring to me and I'm sure it was to a lot of people was that the you've been elected you were re-elected a number of times was 2007 the sweetest because it was the first well they were all favor but but yeah of course that was the first time so it was very very exciting and very exciting once you become elected uh i still think it's got to be some kind of paradox being the first prominent politician of iranian descent because of course it's a point of pride but then a, you also have to you feel the responsibility, the weight of being that first person and that we're all watching you. Uh, tell me about that. Well, uh, yes, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right, Jean. It was, I, I felt always a great responsibility. Uh, the Iranian community, of course, they supported me quite um, heavily. And, uh, and also, as I said, you know, I ran for, for the office partly just to, you know, to serve my country, Canada, my province of Ontario. And also to do a few uh, certain things for the Iranian community so that Iranian community, they feel belonging to, to, to this land yeah. so that, you know, they have someone uh, at the Ontario Parliament who is some to a, to a certain degree representing them, though they may not be, you know, a resident of my riding, but being just Iranian. So one of the things um, I had in my mind to, to do if I got elected was to uh, m bring a legislation to proclaim First Irish Spring as no ruse. Yes. So uh, so fortunately, to you know, officially embed no ruse in the uh, yeah language of the legislature. That, that that's true. So that also. Uh, you know, kind of give uh, recognition to the Iranian community and also other communities who celebrate Noor apart from Iranians. So that kind of things, I think, um, I, I felt I had to do and I did it. And I think people appreciated that. When you become a politician <coughs> that people recognize uh, in in Canada, uh, and even and a cabinet minister, you know, you weren't just a backbench; you were you were you know at the at the table there. Um, did people in the Iranian community 
it wouldn't be a surprise if people wanted you to speak out about issues that are happening in Iran uh, with the regime, <clears throat> with, with whatever. How, how did you walk the line around that? Well, I was, I was quite vocal about human rights issues in Iran. Uh, I was spoken a few times at the Ontario Legislature. I attended various uh, demonstrations in support of the people of Iran. Uh, so, and uh, there was expectations from, from the public, Iranian public. Uh, and also it was my nature as well. I, even there was no expectations, I would have done that because I believe in human rights, I believe in democracy, and I couldn't be just sitting and doing nothing while you know, uh, people in Iran, they're suffering under this dictatorship regime. I have a picture of you and I speaking in front of thousands of people uh, at the Queen's Park during the Green Movement uh, after the Iranian election yes. uh, in 2009. Yeah. And it meant a lot to, to folks to have you there and marching alongside people. Uh, and I always wondered how you could walk the line of doing of, of what you could and couldn't do as a sitting MPP. I mean, were there rules? Would somebody say to you, Hey, you know, don't go to too many of these demonstrations. Or what? How, how do how do you have to walk that line? Well, there was there was no restrictions on me that uh, I, I could I couldn't you know be vocal uh, in relation to human rights issues in Iran. We are fortunately we are in a democratic country, and uh, uh, our country Canada is always has been for human rights issues around the world, including Iran, of course. How do you deal with dissenters, Dr. Moridi? How do you uh, you know, like most politicians and public people, you've had your detractors, you know, uh, those who say that you're part of one militant political group or uh, another or that you have an agenda. Uh, there was this issue in 2016 of allowing Ontario colleges to open satellite campuses in Saudi Arabia. Some people jumped on that as a as a opportunity to attack you. Uh, how do you deal with negative gossip or personal attacks or uh, backlash? Well, I mean, when you're in politics, you have to expect this kind of uh, actions or reactions from the, from the public. But in relation to the I Iranian politics, uh, I didn't have any affiliation with any Iranian uh, political faction. Uh, I respected all of them. I have friends uh, among all of them, every party from far left to far right and in between. Uh, so, um, so I, I think that, that that was the line I always followed. I was always a member of uh, one political party, and that was Liberal Party of Ontario and Liberal Party of Canada. But in relation to Iran, I, I never had any attachment uh, morally or officially to none of the Iranian uh, political organizations. I think I've heard that you're associated with all of them. At different times, you've been a <laughs> communist or uh, this person or that person or whatever, or part of the regime. Or, uh, does it... <coughs> Does it upset you when people get that, would say those things about you? Well, uh, I mean, sometimes people may have, you know, said something that I'm pro this one or pro the other one, but, but after some time, and the general public, they know that I'm not pro anyone. Then. I am pro actually every of them, and I am pro human rights issues in Iran, democracy in Iran. If any Iranian political party is, uh, you know, uh, is advocating human rights and democracy and the rule of law in Iran, I supported them. I didn't support other aspects of their activities, maybe, which I didn't like. Mm. Uh, but uh, those aspects, of course, I, I support. I support it and I will support. I feel like <clears throat> since the 2018 election, you're no longer in office. I feel like you've been more politically outspoken. You spoke at a demonstration last week. Do you? Is that true? Do you feel more free to give your opinion on, on uh, issues and demonstrations, et cetera, mm. now? Or, or is it the same as it always was? It's the same you? as always. As as in the past. I mean, everybody knows that I'm, I'm pro-human rights in Iran. Yeah. That, that's what I do. How hard <clears throat> was it to, to not win in 2018? Um, well, not winning is, is, is not easy, of course, it is hard, but I used to tell people who came to me and you know, showed some of their sympathy, and I said, well, <clears throat> we are living in a democratic country. You know, it, I wasn't supposed to be there forever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so well, we the, were getting used to uh, having you there. Well, so, yeah. the time will come that people will say we need a new blood or new person or a uh, new thinking, a new style of politics. So uh, that's that's democracy. So, yeah, I, but, uh, no, it wasn't hard, actually. You seem like a, are you generally a positive person? Can you see things in a positive light? I try to be, Gian. I try to be a positive person. I try my best, yes.
Can I ask you, um, you lost your son suddenly yes. in 2013. Yes. I, I don't know if you feel comfortable talking about it. I certainly don't want to push you into any conversation that doesn't feel right. But I wondered if you could um, reflect on how that affected you, how that changed you. I remember it well, and I remember our family going to your, uh, it was a public memorial. It was uh, very difficult. He was a young man. Yes, that, that was a very, uh, very, very tough, very, very tough moment in my life. Very tough moment. Very tough moment. It will never disappear from my memory. It will always be there, Gian. Yeah. Yeah. I hear the, I hear the news um, standing at the aisle, at, uh, at the airplane, at Ankara Airport, when our plane landed. And we um, we get up, and uh, my chief of staff was sitting behind me, a couple of seats behind me. And at that time, he gave his BlackBerry to me and said, "Minister, um, speak." And I found my daughter Marjan; she was on the phone and giving me the news. So it was very, very tough. Did it? Very tough. Did it change you in some way? Well, I guess it did. I mean, um, this kind of thing changed you and for life, yes. It was very tough. What can you tell us about him? Well, it was very, very tough, as you know. It's very tough. Okay. Yeah. Very tough. Yeah, that evening and days followed and the month followed, eat the year. And of course, years after that, has mm -hmm. been very tough. Mm -hmm. Do you have a fond memory of him that you go go to in your mind? Well, there are lots of lots of fun fun days and memories, and um, yeah, of course, you know, he going to school, and uh, you know, our trip to Europe, and then to Fiji, living in Fiji Islands. Mm. Um, he he was an uh, he he was an athlete. Um, yeah, I mean, lot lots of stories, yeah. lots of fun memories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, <coughs> you uh, certainly haven't slowed down. You um, you're very active on a number of issues. You still sometimes. Uh, it's surprising to me that you're you're not still MPP because people <laughs> invoke your name and I see you turning up at events and I see you speaking and I see you at demonstrations. Um, you you are in your mid seventies. Uh, you, 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 by the way, you you don't age. You've looked exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the you. Last, <laughs> even pictures of you I see, except for when you had more hair. You look exactly the same. <laughs> Thank You've got you, the reservoir D look. Thank uh, you. Um, you seem to have no interest in slowing down. Would that be right? Well, uh, I mean, this is me, uh, Gian. I never. Uh, some, one day, somebody asked me, "When are you going to retire?" And I said, when I die. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I, I think that one should, one should serve the community, the society, as much as you have the energy, as much as you can. I mean, at one point, you may not be able to serve, but, mm, but as much as you can. So um, I will keep You'll going. You'll keep going. I will keep going as long as I can. Well, your Wikipedia page... <laughs> I don't know if this is, you know this, I mean, because sometimes things turn up on Wikipedia that you don't mean to say, but yeah. it says, uh, this is quite extraordinary because politicians don't, aren't usually this <laughs> candid about it. It says, he intends to contest his former seat as member of provincial parliament for Richmond Hill in four years. I presume that was written in, uh, in, in 2018. So I I is this true? You're going to run again? Uh, no, actually, I, I declared to the last year that I'm not going to run again. Listen, if Wikipedia still says it. <laughs> well, I have to tell Wikipedia to change that line. I <laughs> still somebody, believe it. Sometimes it's, somebody it. should tell them to change it. No, Is that true? You're, you're definitely, you've, you've hung up the skates? Yes. And you don't yeah, yeah. I, I, I formally uh, announced that I'm not going to run in the next election. And why is that? Well, I think, you know, I did my part for 11 years, the term, and uh, I think, you know, maybe new blood, new new generation, uh, they, they should come and run. 
So I, I can contribute in other ways to the society as a whole. Yeah. What do you um, What do you most want to on this Canada Day for the real new Canadians for for um, Iranians who either are just landing here or who aspire to come here? Um, what is your best advice to a new immigrant? Well, I always advise, particularly Iranians, the first thing I would tell them, try to learn English as much as you can. And if you know some English, uh, <clears throat> try to learn more English because mm. that's essential for you. The second thing is uh, I advise them to learn more about Canada, Canadian history. So try to learn it and also try to learn multiculturalism. Uh, try to uh, transfer some of... How do you uh, learn multiculturalism? <clears throat> well, um, you just uh, talk to your neighbors mm. uh, you know talk, you know walk on, on the street your street and knock on doors and say hello to your neighbors <laughs> uh, you find one neighbor from India one neighbor from Germany one neighbor right, from right, France right. one neighbor from Iran and others so talk to your neighbors and uh, learn from their culture their language their tradition uh, it's very helpful and this is the best education you can have you know, almost all countries around the world, they are multinational countries. Mm. There are 6,000 languages spoken in the world. It means that there are 6,000 ethnicities in the world. But we have only 200 countries, member, less than 200 countries right, in right. the world. So every country around the world is a multinational country, multi-ethnic country. And every country around the world, they should learn from Canada. Even our own homeland, the country of birth, Iran, is a multinational, multi-ethnic country. So we should learn from Canada how in Canada we respect each other's language, we respect each other's culture, each other's tradition, uh, and we are all Canadians. Uh, so every country around the world should do, um, basically should follow Canada. Is there anything to be done about the uh, political divisions within our community? The fact that uh, there's these, strong emotions that have been in some cases imported uh, from Iran mm -hmm. and these stark divisions where that that uh, arise where people just can't get along sometimes well I, th I think in the past um, this might have been true but I think things are improving Gian you do N yes now I could see that uh, for example Iranians from leftist groups and then the rightist groups they are now sitting together and they're working together on various projects really uh, yes so this is uh, maybe yeah, around are, flight 752 uh, yeah, that was a moment of <clears throat> a moment of unity but I, I I where do you see them sitting together and working uh, well, on that, that was one of the beginnings yes that that is true and at that time actually I invited those groups together up with a yes. few people and then we got together but after that I've seen a number of uh, occasions that people are you know getting closer to each other and I've tried to let them know that you know when you are uh, these uh, political parties they are not enemies with each other they are your opponents with each other mm -hmm. you're not enemies so uh, your goal is all your goal is the same uh, so you want freedom for Iran, you want democracy for Iran, and all of that. And even in Canada, I said, look, look at Canada. Uh, here we have uh, various political parties. We are not each other's enemies. We are each other's opponents. Our goal is uh, is to serve Canada, uh, but our path are different. You know, one party is saying this path is the best. The other party is saying no, my path uh, uh, is is the best. So there is a difference in ideas mm. and at the end people decide which path is the best for the time being uh, maybe if, you know after four years uh, they change their mind so that's the nature of politics politics is not exact science um, so so that is the difference between politics and exact science and exact science two times two always makes four in politics two times two sometimes makes five sometimes makes six sometimes makes zero <laughs> uh, so I, I think the Iranian people from Iranian backgrounds having some Iranian political affiliations, they're getting to realize that very fact. Do you think we're, we being people of Iranian descent, are somehow worse at unity than others? Well, I, I, I don't think so. This is, I mean, the nature of politics, right? Uh, differences uh, and separation of uh, of ideas and the, and the thoughts um, is inherited in in the in the nature of politics. Um, 
But because Iran has never been a democratic country, mm-hmm. um, maybe one of the reasons is that you know Iranian politicians or people or political activists, they're coming from that background, they're bringing that baggage, mm-hmm. uh, saying that they have to stick in their silo and they uh, look at the other people with suspicions, etc. But I think things are changing. Would you ever go back to live in Iran? Well, not under the current no, regime, well, but know, of course. Uh, could you? I don't think if you couldn't even go uh, back there. Could you? Could you visit Iran right now? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think it probably wouldn't be a good idea. Right? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you don't think You're so, not, or you know no, it wouldn't no. be a good idea. Uh, uh, it's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if if democracy, uh, or to a certain degree of democracy established in Iran, I'm sure many many Iranians. Uh, maybe they may not go back to live in Iran, but I'm, I'm sure they are going to go back and uh, work there. Or maybe some business people they may, you know, they may start investing in Iran. This will this will happen, I'm sure. Dr. Reza Mordi, it's um, it's a pleasure to have you in the Rook Studio. Uh, it is always a pleasure to see you, and uh, I, I certainly never forget you always being there. Uh, you know, I'll never forget you there in the in the in the T-shirt with your arm raised uh, uh, in 2009 in those Green Movement protests, and and thinking, wow, that guy's a cabinet minister and he's out here with us doing this, and um, uh, and really appreciating that. And uh, I wish you a happy Canada Day, and I thank you for doing this. Well, thank you very much, um, Gian, for inviting me to part, to be a part of this show, and thank you for Rock for this invitation. It was always a great honor to walk with you, to march with you on that uh, very day in Green Movement. Yes, I do remember that very vividly uh, with uh, several thousands of people and you and I were marching at the front of the, uh, you know, the crowd. And uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me to be uh, on this show. It was a thank great you. honor. I hope to see you thank again you. soon. Thank you, me too. Dr. Reza Moridi scientist, physicist, professor, the first ever politician from the Iranian community elected to any legislature in Canada or the United States. Dr. Reza Moridi, join me here in the Rook studio today. Dr. Reza Mordi has left the Rook studio and uh, Keon has come back in and Captain Reza and Groovy Shia. I think we've taken, uh, I mean, he was celebrated by the community. A couple years ago, there was a big uh, uh, evening uh, gala sort of celebration of the, I guess, political career and life of Dr. Mordi and a lot of members of our community were there and the ex-premier was there and uh, I was there. We was very, very happy to laud him. But I, I think, to a certain extent, he's been taken for granted, yeah. you know, because mm-hmm. when a politician is there for many years and and uh, everyone's got uh, an issue that uh, he has or hasn't dealt with, and you know, uh, y- you forget that he was uh, a pioneer and mm-hmm. he's just had such an impressive life and yeah. continues to bring such a, a beautiful perspective to things. Yeah. Yeah, in in general, he's just a very kind and warm um, human being, and just <laughs> I, I I've known him for years, and obviously he's been a trailblazer into Canadian politics, so we're very proud of that. But um, just hearing his story, I, he's never I don't believe he's done an interview like this, not that I'm aware of, anyway. So it's uh, it was just yeah. it was a pleasure to hear. He's him done some sp- uh, the English interviews he's done, he's, he's done have often had to do with legislation right. or to, to do right. with something. Right, never about but, yeah. his life. So, yeah. I, I I mean, I'm just very proud of him. I'm sure most Iranians mm-hmm. are. He's, representation is so, so important, and it means so much to see an Iranian up there in Canadian politics, and he was the first. So, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And also, most importantly, as you mentioned, uh, Keon, he's trim. You know, he's kept himself trim. <laughs> most importantly. Uh, that's Keon's uh, uh, <laughs> you first, said it first. first observation. Uh, did I? Well, I said he hasn't changed his look. Right. His face I was thinking about. But, well. Uh, <laughs> just, just, <laughs> I, no, I was, uh, through the interview, I was obsessed with his body after you talked about that. <laughs> like, how trim is he? What's going on? Uh, but uh, no, I agree with you, Gian. And I think I was thinking about the same thing. I'm like, the first time I heard about, uh, I heard of Mr. Moridi, Dr. Moridi, um, I, I was so excited because I didn't know I just moved to Canada. And I was like, wow, we have an Iranian mm. member of the parliament and stuff. And then he became a, a, a became minister. But uh, I think one of the reasons is that he's very accessible. Mm-hmm. He's very accessible to his peers, his con- constituents, and and he he was even saying that people reach out to him in the middle of the night from like other provinces to solve his uh, to solve like pr- looking for solutions mm-hmm. to their problems and stuff, and I think him his accessibility and him being out there for his community and his people makes him makes him uh, feel that way that oh my God we've been taking him for granted he's such a jewel of our community I'm very mm-hmm. proud you were uh, proud. you were uh, that was cute watching him say. Uh, goodbye there you were like a little uh starstruck there i was reza. i was i you really know? was I really reza was. he's yeah. normally like ah. <laughs> yeah and he's like no, you know I making was. jokes and stuff <laughs> and uh he, he was uh, he was doing the iranian bow and i like, was <laughs> i really was <laughs> so <laughs> polite and yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no i really was i i've like i've met uh, like i met a few celebrities my entire life nobody really is impresses me has impressed me as much as he has mm-hmm. like and he's such a kind soul too and is very down to earth like he's got all the elements everything that i aspire to be and i'm not and i don't think i'll ever be (laughs) but uh, he is uh is such a kind and generous man i love him Mm -hmm. i really love him Mm -hmm. by the way i love that picture of you and uh moridi at the 2009 uh, protest i I haven't shared that uh, with uh uh, only with you guys but maybe i'll put that up yeah i I was looking for his photos and i saw it uh, i I (laughs) almost got emotional when he was talking about that it's that's what a special memory to have with you That's yeah beautiful. yeah 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 we were i mean it wasn't just one event too he was um uh actually maybe i will post that picture of mm-hmm. it's from the the green movement in 2009 and you see him there in his t-shirt uh, you know mm-hmm. he and i marching together uh, this was at a few events that we spoke at and and you know he's, he's wearing a t-shirt that says human rights and uh, you know it's and i mean politicians are humans and and a lot of them are great good humans who want to do good things and and who can be activists and uh, as well but there was something about this dignified scientist getting out there who's cabinet minister at the time and 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 uh being part of our protests that uh, i think we really appreciated mm-hmm. you know yeah uh i didn't know him actually before this interview is that right yeah yeah, I yeah. Didn't, and actually i'm impressed by him being humble and you know it's true because mm-hmm. when you compare uh, Mr. Moridi to some politician from Iran, they always come with you know with bodyguards and uh, mm-hmm. if, if, even if they don't have any official, but they still wants to mm-hmm. keep that uh, image. But yeah, I mean Mr. Moridi, he was like you know my brother no bodyguards yeah, yeah no yeah. Oh, he was worried about getting a ticket he's like is it okay if i park there my meter i think is gonna run out yeah. so would have been right. nice to get him a bodyguard to keep him away from reza <laughs> 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 he has like Slobbering. a man crush yeah. over yeah. there <laughs> the drag <laughs> drag reza away from him <laughs> 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 what can i do Keon? he's in great shape <laughs> you know when uh, earlier when we were talking about shia getting his immigration status i was wondering if there's a way to send reza back <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can so talk can to there be some uh, you know Supreme Court ruling to send uh, Reza back to Iran? Uh, <laughs> A restraining order from <laughs> Reza Moradi, maybe? Uh, uh, speaking of immigration, a big thank you again to Kati Kavandi and Kati Kavandi Immigration Services Incorporated for making this edition of Rook possible. This is a full-service immigration firm that offers all inland and overseas uh, immigration services, including temporary visas, permanent visas, PR extensions, and citizenship applications. Mm. Shia? Yes. Uh, Kati and her team are available available to maybe we can get a deal because she's uh you know uh supporting rook uh uh her team are available to inform and assist you as their client throughout the immigration process if you want to come to canada or you're here and you need support you need an immigration counselor katy is your person katy kovandi immigration services uh, we have put the link to how you can reach her on all of our platforms there if you just look in the descriptions 
Well, it's Thursday, and you know what that means. She's a dear friend, a diaspora blend, a tennis-playing sensation, and a bicultural relation. Lovable, smart, occasionally funny, and on a journey to discover what we actually discovered. Here we go, Batchaha. It's all Persian to us with Kian Narami. <laughs> <laughs> Russ is such a junky cowboy. <laughs> well, what uh, now? I, I just loved last week the uh, the fictional uh, so case funny. of uh, the war against Egypt, one with uh, felines and uh, uh, swinging cats. But uh, I I cannot wait for what you have for us this week. What have we discovered? First of all, how dare you? It's always nonfiction with me. Yes, but anyway, I'll let that one go. Well, since today's Canada Day got me thinking, what makes this such a great country? And generally, why do we choose to even live here? Spoiler alert, it's definitely not because of the weather. So Canada is a country known for its freedom, multiculturalism, extreme politeness, we say sorry like a lot here, free healthcare, and maple syrup. Mm -hmm. And definitely not in that order because maple syrup always comes first for me. It's a major pillar that makes this country so great. So how does a country organize itself to offer its citizens the best possible outcome for their individual lives? Mm. Well, why don't we start by looking at the four pillars of democracy? First being freedom, which speaks for itself. Equality is the second one. Again, that speaks for itself. Representation, which means having the right to vote in uh, elected official to represent you. And justice, mm. probably one of the most important. Uh, the people are protected and treated fairly. So these four pillars are the very reason that there's currently an estimated 400,000 Iranians living in Canada. Hmm. Can you guess when the first Iranian immigrated into Canada? Jian? Anybody? It wasn't me. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might have been. So, <laughs> well, uh, was it, which member of my family stepped off the plane first? <laughs> actually, my dad, he came a bit before uh, us. So. The year was actually 1901 when the first oh, Iranian wow. ever landed on Canadian soil. That was not my family. No. Wow. <laughs> so they trickled in by the dozens in the next few decades, by the hundreds after World War II, and obviously the real influx of Iranians immigrated uh, into Canada after the 1979 revolution when they started arriving by the thousands. So we left our roots, our homeland, everything we know and love for the four pillars of democracy, but mainly just one, freedom. Yes. Well, I couldn't help but notice some of the parallels when comparing a democratic country like Canada to ancient Persia. The parallels? Yeah, the parallels. The parallels. Is that not what I said? <laughs> you said the parallels. <laughs> the parallels. Yeah, it sounds like a pair of lels. I don't know what those are. <laughs> the parallels. But anyway, please. You're messing with my mind. <laughs> so the irony is it's an that... an interesting parallel that you've drawn. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the irony is that this is a comparison of modern Canada to ancient Persia. Oh. The concept of freedom is like so yesterday in Iran today. <laughs> That's a dark joke. But anyway, so we already know that Cyrus the Great established the first Persian Empire in 539 BC. He abolished slavery and released the world's first ever chart of human rights, stating that all people living within the empire are free to practice any religion, culture, and speak any language they wish to. He actually uh -huh. shout out to Cyrus. <laughs> shout out to Cyrus always. I think he gets a man. mention on every show. <laughs> I, I think he gets a mention by every Persian. Like even Moridi mentioned him, <laughs> you know. So he actually respected the customs and religions of the lands he conquered instead of enforcing his own onto them, which is a pretty huge deal during that time. But how was Cyrus able to manage and enforce all of this in such a massive empire? Pass that on. <laughs> well, that's of. not Shire, so that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's, that's later. <laughs> the message. Did he use that the message? Sabak. No, they learned. The, <laughs> uh. the, the dark history of the. <laughs> <laughs> how did he enforce? Yeah. I'm trying to <laughs> draw the parallels this, of how right. beautiful it is. Oh, like, sorry. You're right. turning yes. it down. The parallels, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, well, first off, he divided the empire into 26 different satrapies, meaning provinces, 
with the uh, central government sitting in Pasar God, kind of like Ottawa in Canada. Mm -hmm. He mm. then instituted a government with himself at the top, surrounded by advisors who relayed his decrees to secretaries, who then passed these on to 20, the 26 satraps, or governors, or premiers, like Sorry, in Canada. Sorry, hang on a second. Your thesis for this week's, uh, <laughs> it's all Persian to us, <laughs> is that Canada uh -huh. is, is a parallel. Uh-huh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> now stay to, with me. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I, I'm just coping with the pronunciation, let alone uh, <laughs> the thesis, but is a, is a parallel with ancient Persia. That's right. I not see. modern Iran. Not, not modern Definitely Iran. Definitely not modern right, Iran. Right. Yes. This is a... So, uh, it's all okay. Right. All right. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. there were 26 satraps. These were like governors or premiers in each province. Um, it was quite satrapulous, actually. Okay. <laughs> These governors. You can't no. say satrapulous, <laughs> but you can't say parallel. Yeah. So that's what uh, spelt. So if, you, if you spent a little less time on the borscht belt humor <laughs> and a little more time on. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, so these governors only had authority over bureaucratic and administrative matters, while a military commander in the same region oversaw military and police matters. So a trap would oversee, a, a satrap, not a trap, a satrap, <laughs> would oversee the region basically ruling on behalf of the king, because obviously the king cannot visit every region of his massive empire. Clearly. Right, so they served as the chief judge within the province, overseeing disputes and sentencing punishments for crimes. They also collected taxes, which were sent to the central government, kind of like Canada, actually, and also appointed and removed local officials. Now, these satraps had a lot of power, so how were they controlled and prevented from having too much power? Well, each satrap... Passage. <laughs> <laughs> sort oh, of, actually. Okay. Each satrap answered to a royal secretary known as the Eye of the King. Wow. Yes. And just to be sure, like extra sure, the chief financial officer and the general in charge of the troops for each satrapi reported directly to the king mm. rather than the satrap. Can I just ask a question? Yes. If the thesis of this is that Canada is a parallel to ancient Persia. Yes. Is and then you, the the idea of the segment is things we discovered. Are you saying we discovered Canada? No, I'm kind of I'm I'm <laughs> in, well in a way I'll get to it. We were the first. Um, I like, don't want to say spoiler alert here. Well, I don't want to well, I mean, rush to I'll the end. I'll get to but, it. I'll get to yeah, it. But right. it's this was this level like this structure of government was the first of its kind. Like okay. basically Ooh. other empires right. learned from us and right. kind of organized that way. I mean we were one of the most successful empires. So right. the. Next and then we continued that for 2,000 for, years. For a while, and then, you know, <laughs> things went to shit later. But anyway, and it, then it was, was nice so successful in the beginning, that right. it has nothing to do with the current <laughs> right, Iranian nothing, reality. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, like so I said. So the set traps, yeah. And, right. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, so the king basically uh, still had enough, like held all the power, all the uh -huh. military. Yeah. Was so, the king Cyrus? Yes. Okay, um, but then right. later on, preceding kings Other like kings. Darius and right. Combeses, Combes yeah. And yeah. Combes. Abbey. So, yeah. right. <laughs> After all, whoever controls the military <laughs> controls the nation. So, <laughs> by div. <laughs> It's like Please, a yeah, classroom of children over here. <laughs> yeah. so we're trying, so, to, trying to hold it together. Yeah. Yeah. So by dividing the responsibilities. Should we do this one over a few episodes? How long is this? <laughs> yeah, I'm almost there. It's okay, getting all right, good. Yeah. All right. So by dividing the responsibilities of government in each satrapi, Cyrus made sure to lessen the chance of any official amassing enough money and power to attempt a coup, perhaps. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it was very likely back in ancient times. So this later, like I said, became the model for a centralized administration and establishing a government working to the advantage and profit of its subjects, meaning for the people. Does that sound familiar? It's kind of like Canada, mm. right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So this was a system of bureaucracy way advanced for its time. But beyond that, the empire succeeded because of its foundation built on freedom and equality for its people during a time when the foundations of other nations were being built on slavery. I'm not naming any names, but looking at you, ancient Egypt. Anyway, we're uh, we're nowhere. Wait, every every one of these segments turns into an anti-Egypt <laughs> <laughs> screed. Yeah. No, I'm what just. Did the I, what did the, the Egyptians I'm ever drawing, do to you? I'm drawing a comparison because during ancient times, like Egypt was one of them. Like right. their whole entire empire was built on slavery. I know. Persia had no slavery. That's well, that's a big deal, man. <laughs> like they they actually paid 
workers to complete work. Meanwhile, yeah. other nations, surrounding nations, had slaves. Are you so saying, yeah, Reza? Yeah, yeah. Uh, man, I those mean, guys were yeah. worshipping cats. If that is an advance for you, I don't know what is. In ancient, like, the, we're talking right. about 500 right. BC. Right. So we're nowhere near where we used to be as a nation, obviously, but Persia was once the prototype for a fair, multi-ethnic, and relatively peaceful civilization. Wow. It once had a long-lasting and successful commitment to justice, fairness, and openness. We're a long way from home now, both literally and figuratively. So until the day that we can return, Canada is now home. But yet somehow, it's all Persian to us. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Well, that was very full marks for innovation. You know, you're telling the story of ancient Persia, mm -hmm. weaving it in with Canada. It's a bit of a stretch, but I, <laughs> I do appreciate the tenets mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, democracy and freedom. That, right. that, uh, that It's always, you know, I, I, I kid, but it's always a difficult one for us, right? Like where mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're, this is part of an important history that we want to communicate and, and take some pride in. And, and remember. At the same time taking pride in something that happened 2,500 years ago that has nothing to do with us. It's you know a I mean? reminder of who we are, Jian, because this current Iran, this government, does not... I, I don't sure. know, I'm, everybody probably But with an intervention with of at least, you know, a, a number of centuries. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know? it's a reminder that we need to go back to home, go back to who we were as a people. This is who we were. We were multicultural. We were so accepting and, and just kind people. And we still are, you know. It, that's why I, I truly believe this government in Iran, they're not Iranian. Like, I don't know what the hell they are, but this mm. is, there's no way they have Persian blood in them because... Who in the right mind? You think they're Egyptian? Because <laughs> of the way you feel <laughs> about is, the Egyptians. It's just <laughs> not us. It's not like us. So who built the pyramids, by the way? Slaves. Not not who actually built <laughs> the pyramids, but the Egyptians. Slaves built. No, them. I know the slaves. Well, <laughs> Literally, <laughs> slaves. Aliens. Beautiful, the beautiful right. the pyramids. Dude, have you ever heard of a slave building uh, Pasar God or Persopolis? No, it was all Persopolis. Hired. Persopolis. Pers Perspolis, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. the parallel. These were these were yeah. paid jobs. Like the workers were paid for their work. Can so. I right. add to that parallel? Please, actually? always. No, please. In in ancient Iran and especially in Hachamanishan uh, and the Cyrus. Uh, actually, it was a very common herb. Uh, they call it hum, which is nowadays marijuana. Oh, and so oh. It's See, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> now we're taught the parallel. I like this parallel. Yeah. So, yeah, we invented weed. <laughs> 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 no, but I mean, in Canada, it's legal. And so, uh, back in the day, in in Iran's oh, go. government, yeah. they use uh, hum. That's as a true. I think I read about this. Maybe yeah, it's a whole. It's a holy. Uh, help that uh, right. Ho holistic or Ho you mean holy holy holy, holy like holy uh, no, holy uh, holy, uh -huh. yeah. like religious yes yes accepted. yes they use it yeah. well wow, fabulous mm. it okay. is very holy yeah. for shy and i as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> well uh the very interesting thank you kian jun um Keon? Yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> Are you answering text <laughs> messages? <laughs> <laughs> it's your segment. <laughs> <laughs> You're What's welcome. <laughs> I thought it was just, you know, you were going to thought it was over. I yeah. thought you were going <laughs> to close the chapter and <laughs> right. move on. I was saying thank you. Yeah. You're thank welcome. Thank you, Keon June. Always. Thank you, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. Thanks to everybody out there. This is full time for Rook for today. For all things Rook, including how to become a patron of this program. And support us with a five or ten dollar a month donation. Rookmedia.com, and you press the support us button at Rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week: producer Susan Ponta, the artist; thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon; savvy Roham; super Patty Saw; sponsorship Sean; Aray Merdad. Captain Rezan Gurvishaya. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe on any of our platforms if you've not done so already it is free and you can find me on instagram at gian gomeshi and as ever mizunbashi <laughs>